So it's, uh, I'd like to get started and uh, introduce our speaker tonight. But first, I want to mention a couple of things that are going on here at the Zen Center. Uh, this is part of a series that we put together of events. This is a little bit of an experiment for us as a Zen Center. Um, but uh, we start off with a movie, and tonight um, we are trying to break down some of these barriers uh, between Dartmouth and our community practice center by um, introducing some dialogue here bet uh, between um, those who, who study uh, these matters and those of us who uh, practice here in our Zen Center. Um, and next month, well, not, not next month, March, uh, there's not, uh, the last Thursday in March, uh, we're taking, uh, there will not be an event here, but in April, uh, Charles Myers Acupuncturist is going to come and uh, speak to us about mind, body, and Chinese medicine. And in the end of uh, May, uh, Herb Ferris and I will uh, have a discussion about Tibetan Zen practice from our points of view. And, um, and then in June, uh, the last event in this series, we've invited Simon Dennis and Karen Ganey, who represent Transition Town, and I guess maybe also the select board of the town of Hartford, um, to come and speak about their uh, work with Transition Town and the notion of how of the intersection between personal practice and global issues like <coughs> the environment. Um, so those, those, with those things coming up, I also want to mention a uh, seminar, two seminars that are going to be happening at Dartmouth in April. This is a lot of information, I realize. <laughs> but um, we are, uh, the Zen Center is also involved in sponsoring these two seminars. Um, the first one in early April is entitled A Buddhist, Perspect Buddhist Perspectives on Power, Gender, and Sexual Misconduct. So we're um, inviting a teacher from the West Coast named Grace Shearson who is a Zen teacher and also a, a clinical psychologist, um, to come and lead a discussion on this topic, which uh, has increasingly become a matter of, of public uh, attention. Uh, we are doing this in uh, collaboration to s with Shambhala uh, Center, and they have provided us with a movie, Crazy Wisdom, about the life of Trungpa Rinpoche. Uh, which we will be showing as part of that seminar. So that's April 5th and 6th. And then April 23rd, an old friend of ours, Red Pine, who's been here a couple of times before, uh, AKA Bill Porter, who has um, been a prolific translator of uh, many uh, texts from the Chinese tradition into English. And he's also quite a character and a wonderful storyteller. Um, he is coming to Dartmouth on April 23rd to lead a discussion or do a presentation on his latest translation, which is the Lankavatara Sutra, which is a uh, text that uh, historically is associated with the character of Bodhidharma, the first uh, patriarch of Zen in China, who is credited with having brought the Lankavatara from India uh, to China uh, sometime in the 6th century uh, AD. I'm sure Gil will correct me if I'm wrong. Um, you may have. <laughs> but, um, so, Red Pine has spent uh, a lot of time and energy uh, working on this uh, subtle and difficult text. And we are pleased and fortunate to have copies of this 
for sale here at the Zen Center in preparation for our Red Pines appearance. Uh, and these texts were selling for $25 here, which is $5 off the list price, I have to point out. Um, here's an example. Here's a happy customer right over here. Uh, hard cover, man. Hard cover. And uh, we will also, starting next Thursday, we will devote our study group, which normally meets on Thursday nights, to a reading of the Lankavatar in preparation for a Red Pines visit uh, in April. So uh, you're welcome to sign up for that, as well as um, purchase the book. Uh, one last uh, sort of, uh, plug for our latest endeavor, which is we have a, a little sewing workshop that's moved in on the basement floor here of the museum. So we were all excited when we saw Nicole Hastings set up her, her workshop and said, how would you like to uh, go in with us on a project making Zen cushions? So Nicole, Nicole has um, been working on sewing Zen cushions for us, uh, which are on display here. Um, this is a brown one, needless to say. And she's also making black and red. So the idea is, uh, but you know, I guess it, eventually there may be other colors that people can <laughs> order. But this is um, a way for us to try to make uh, cushions and make them available to the community at um, what feels to us like a, a reasonable price for local, local product. Shop local. So, so you don't have to send mail order to China anymore. <laughs> and there's um, the big ones too, the big square ones. And yes, and the big square mats. And the little, and she's also making these little uh, support cushions that go underneath. Um, anyway, that's all available through, through the Zen Center. We're still working out the details of the price, but um, so far it looks pretty good. Uh, so, having said all that, let me introduce uh, Professor Gil Raz from Dartmouth, who will speak tonight about the Taoist roots of Zen. And um, uh, I will just be quiet now and let you take it from here. Okay? All right. Well, thank, thank you. Uh, um, and thank you all for uh, inviting me for coming out on this very cold slippery night. <clears throat> and uh, I'll begin by sort of just um, apologizing for two and two levels. When Alan asked to come to come and give this talk, it was many, many months ago, and I was in Edinburgh living at you know, the high life of not working at all. I said, sure, I'll come in February, no problem. But actually, I'm actually teaching now. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I said, oh my god, what have I done? So I'm not as well prepared as I should probably be, but also because I'm not, I'm not quite sure what I wasn't quite sure what to really expect. So I prepared sort of the kind of a lecture, um, but we can fair it up depending on how it goes. Um, Thousands of Zen was really Alan's um, choice of a title. Um, I'm very weary of metaphors and root is not a metaphor I would have chosen for this because we're going to talk about something that really lacks roots, but it does have, I guess it is the Taoist roots of Zen. But what I'm really going to talk about are minds and mirrors. So the mirrors are the roots I'm actually going to talk about. Um, I'm going to try and talk about some very basic concepts um, that maybe still inform Zen practice today, but they were very important in Zen practice in the second century. So anything past the century for me is really sort of new. I work on my real work, my real research is on Taoist practices from about the first century to about the sixth century. So even Zen is kind of new to me. <laughs> um, I'll talk about that in a minute. But anything beyond the like seventh century is like reading the newspapers. <laughs> um, besides, I also did a lot of field work in Taiwan. So actually, 21st century Taoism I also know a lot of that. It's in between and not I'm kind of vague. <laughs> So um, this is some place where we are in time and in space. So Buddhism, as you all know, started off in northern India on the border with, with, with Nepal, a place called Bodhgaya, sometime in the 6th century, uh, with, with Prince Siddhartha Gautama uh, Shakyamuni, 
who at the age of, um, age of 35 becomes enlightened, um, and then becomes known as the Buddha, the enlightened one. And he, and he starts teaching and walking around, literally walking around northern India, and it's a little bit in southern India, I suppose, um, spreading his teachings. And very soon, within a century or two, there are many, 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 many teachings. Right? None of those teachings are anything to do with, with them, by the way. The Buddhists sort of spread out from what is, first into what is today Afghanistan, one of the most important centers in this place here, Gandhara, which you may, if any of you watch the killing of Bin Laden, you'll know that this was known today as Kandahar, the heart of the Taliban. But Gandhara was the heartland of, of Buddhism. So the giant statues that you sometimes hear vague, but I knew that are being destroyed are all in that area. So this is really, really very, very important area for the history of Taoism, sort of Buddhism, before it arrives in China. Um, so Gandhara is an important place, and it so it went up further north and then through um, the Silk Road here into China. Dunhuang, I will mention this place, is sort of the border between China, sort of Imperial China, and then Central Asia. This was sort of the last outpost of the Chinese Empire. So Dunhuang, which I'll mention briefly because one of the manuscripts we look at is a Dunhuang text, um, was a place where a lot, of, a lot of these people came in right? and kind of there and became a really center, flourishing center for Buddhism but also for this kind of um, <coughs> inter-ethnic or interlinguistic sort of encounters. Um, Buddhism arrives in China about five or six centuries after it starts in India. It comes mainly on the Silk Road from the north into Chang'an, today it's called Xi'an. And another route is from the south. All right? This might be, in fact, the route that Bodhidharma may have taken. <laughs> it's quite likely that Bodhidharma is a good person. I'll talk about it in a minute. Buddhism starts off, as you know, with all these various traditions. Um, some scholars call it mainstream Buddhism. Some people like to call it Hinayana, which is really a pejorative term, so don't, don't ever use Hinayana. Um, but, um, <laughs> People who are based in northern India and Gandhar towards Central Asia begin a new tradition called Mahayana, right? The great vehicle. So it's always driving the great vehicle that called the all the tradition, the older tradition, Hinayana. The Hinayana spread to the south to Sri Lanka, which is where the Lanka Vatara Sutra actually comes from. The Lanka is Sri Lanka. So the Lanka Vatara Sutra just bought its study source for this area. Um, <clears throat> So the Mahayana is spread to the north, and we'll talk a little bit about what, what distinguishes Mahayana from, Hina, from the other tradition in a minute. <coughs> so, there, so the Buddhists arrive in China around the first century or so, uh, of the Christian era. They begin to intermingle, integrate into Chinese culture. At that time, it's a, it's a flourishing Chinese empire, the Han Dynasty. It's a very Confucian sort of dynasty. Taoism, which I'll talk about in a minute, is also so flourishing, a lot of local culture. Um, the Buddhism becomes integrated and really changes a lot in its encounter in China. So a lot of the traditions that are active now in China are started in China. There are some texts that were brought in, many, many texts, but they actually influence practices in very different ways in China. So the most important schools in China today are called, for example, Pure Land. Um, those texts did come from Central Asia, but they took on a lot of their own in China and several others of those. The Chan tradition, or the Zen tradition, did not come from anywhere. It started in China. Mm -hmm. right. We'll talk about the mythology of it, but it actually started in China, probably by someone may, who may be Mr. Bodhidharma or somebody else who <laughs> thought about Bodhidharma, started in the 5th or 6th century, and then people talk about the Zen tradition as being particularly Chinese. And one of the ways we people think of it being as particularly Chinese is perhaps because of the so-called Taoist influence that it has. Um, this has been a debate among Chinese and, and Japanese scholars for, for a long, long time. What exactly is its influence and how to actually explain it or even how to really define it and find it. Part of the problem is that Zen um, is a very, very loose category in medieval China. It's very hard to know what exactly is Zen. Um, Taoism is also a very, very loose and problematic category. So it is very loose, amorphous, large categories overlapping and interacting, but it's very hard to really pinpoint what exactly is what. But one of the ways that I'll talk about it today, in particular, will be about one particular term, which is the mind as a mirror. And it's a very key term to understand Zen practice. 
Um, but in fact, it's a key Taoist term. So I'll talk about that. Right? And then, of course, the tradition, which is actually not called Zen, it's also called Chan, spreads in Japan, where it, becomes, where it begin, begins to be known as Zen. Um, the actual tradition right, supposedly starts with this person, Bodhidharma. This is a picture of a Hakui, we just mentioned Hakui. Mm -hmm. So the character is this character, um, Chan. But what it is, it doesn't really have any meaning in Chinese. Right? The term Chan, or in Japanese pronunciation, Zen, is actually pronunciation of the Indian term dhyana, which simply means meditation. So when the, in, so when the various Indian, Indian um, uh, practitioners or Central Asian practitioners arrived in China with many, many, many texts, so various types, they all also had particular types of practice of meditation. It's not in particular technique, but the general term to say, we're going to sit down and meditate is dhyana. The Chinese cannot pronounce dhyana, the pronounce is chan, they chose this character, which is an ancient Chinese character, which has something to do with religious practice, um, and use that. And that character is read in Japanese as Zen. And so for now, I will talk about Chan, because people in China talk about this as Chan. One of the ways in which Chan distinguishes itself from other Buddhist traditions is by this concept that we sometimes translate as sudden enlightenment. Right? And this is something that will come up in one of talk about now. The person who's supposed to have initiated this practice is Bodhidharma, who's always portrayed as, very similar to many of us here, I suppose, as a barbarian. That is, he's not Chinese, he's got a beard, uh, he's sort of old, I suppose. Um, and he's, he was, little bit we know about him, he's, he's probably a Brahmin prince from south, south, southern China. Sorry, southern India, rather in China, sometime in the late fifth century. That's pretty clear. After that, it's a little bit vague. He's supposed to have um, stood on a leaf and crossed the Yangtze, which is probably doubtful. <laughs> um, then, he's supposed to have sat in meditation in front of the wall of the Shaolin Monastery for nine years in, in Zazen. That's also unlikely, uh, both because nine years is a long time, but also because Shaolin Monastery is not actually constructed yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's another story. The, the wall story is important for what I'm going to say next. <laughs> um, the, the cave, well, the thing about the wall is the Chinese term is B1, and B is wall, wall um, observation. And some people think he was in a cave and his mind is like a wall. In some cases, the story is that he's in front of the actual wall. Um, B is probably actually Vipassana. It's probably means Vipassana meditation. Mm -hmm. um, so after this, during this encounter with the nine, or the nine years, the next thing I'll talk about happens then, so I'll do in a minute. Um, some stories later on talk about him is inventing Kung Fu, because it's all to do with Shaolin Monastery. That story is not really present until about the 17th century, when Shaolin becomes the center of Kung Fu practice, actually. So a little bit we know about Bodhidharma, but one of the ways that's important is that his biography is not so important for us in, in, its, in, its, in its historical detail but of what people how people use it, how the Zen tradition introduces him, but it's really important to, uh, for the development of the Zen tradition itself. So this story is one of my favorite stories. So while he's sitting there in meditation for a long time in, in front of the Shaolin Monastery, but unbuilt yet, um, so he sits facing the wall. In this story, this is an early version. It's not Shaolin Monastery yet. It's just a wall. Um, the second part here, because Mr. Hoika um, stands next to him, and, you know, says, Master, Master, please teach me, please teach me, please teach me at some point. You know, he realized that you know, Bodhidharma is in such deep meditation, you cannot disturb him, so he cuts off his arm and he throws it at him. Um, I always tell students this is a really good way to attract the teacher of your body, or to the teacher of your throw a piece of your own body at him. Um, but Bodhidharma then turns and says, okay, what, you know, what's the problem? He says, you know, my mind is um, not at peace. I want you to pacify my mind. And that's really the core of Zen practice, but please be another strength, you know, pacifying the mind. Um, and Bodhidharma's reply, of course, is here, you know, bring the mind to me, you know, you know, fix it. And then the response, I cannot find the mind. And <coughs> then, well, that's it. I've pacified your mind. For it's a realization of the absence of the mind. And of course, this is, a, this is actually quite a late story, when actually codify, you know, what they even mean by mind and its absence. And also, it, oh, it's not yet a koan, but it's on the, on the verge of becoming a koan. This is from the probably around the 10th, 11th century when there's a lot of encounter dialogue where the master's teach 
with this kind of encounter dialogues, which I can strip down to what people now use as koans. So in koan, but I would be more like just one sentence. You know, bring your mind to me, um, something like that. So what Dharma's encounter with Hui sort of sets up sort of a model of how the Zen teaching actually works. Right? In this particular case, Bodhidharma teach, teaches Hueta, but realizing Hueta does not have a mind, but also transmits his own mind to him, which is this absence, this emptiness. So what I'm going to talk about is what, what does mind mean for these people? How does, what do they think of as mind? Or well, particularly what they mean that absence of a mind or presence of a mind. Right? So we're going to skip um, a few centuries forward here. And this is what I really want to focus on. It's the platform suit of the sixth patriarch. So Wen Dharma is number one, Hui is number two, um, and Hui Nang, need to give his dates here, is number three. <clears throat> um, so Wen Dharma may have brought the Nakavatar Sutra and other texts, and clearly they were engaged with a lot of text, text reading and so on, practices. Hui Nang, um, according to the story of the sutra, he supported his own biography, was illiterate. And not only was he literate, he really despised text, so here he is, in fact, tearing up the sutras. Right? So he's well known for that, for being unable to read. And the, sixth, the sutra actually tells several times how people come to him and say, can you, can you explain the Lotus Sutra? He says, I've never read, I've never heard of the Lotus Sutra, so what does he say? Because I cannot actually read it. And some says, well, I've read it, I've read it for years and years, I cannot penetrate the truth of the Lotus Sutra. He says, well, read me something of it and I'll you know, tell you. So they read a few lines, oh, I know what it is, and he immediately tells an exact meaning of the Lotus Sutra, and the Diamond Sutra, and all the other sutras. So he's a great um, um, scholar of, of this you know, non-textual non or non-verbal teaching. Right? This is at the heart, of course, of the entire Zen or Chan tradition. So as you, as you probably know, Chan starts in China, because they cannot actually say that. So what they say is that it starts in India with the teaching of Shakyamuni. You probably know the story that Shakyamuni uh, could teach um, in several languages at the same time, in fact, several different sutras at the same time. So he would be lecturing in front, of, you know, in front of the crowd in India, and each person would hear what he's saying in their own language. You know, there are several languages in, the, in India. When the Mahayana sutras um, were created, they, they claimed that while I was teaching the early text, at the same time some people heard different, not just a different, um, in a different language, actually heard a different teaching, and that was the Mahayana teaching. And when the Chan tradition started off, they said, well, in fact, the teaching of Buddha was really captured by one moment in which he was lecturing, and I don't know, maybe it was an Akhavatara, but he was lecturing something, and it picks up the flower, and only Kashyapa smiles and understands, because he grasps the mind of the Buddha that words are actually meaningless. The actual spoken words, particularly written ones, are completely meaningless. It's the actual transmission of the mind to this act of the flower. Then Kashyapa secretly transmits this to one person and on and on for 28 people until it arrives with Bodhidharma, who then arrives in India as the first Chinese patriarch. So they have this whole sense of teaching outside of the scriptures and somehow against scriptures and somehow just mind to mind. So something about the mind is very, very important for the, for the Chan tradition. So the story of Hoi Lang is this, he's, he's a literate person, he, he comes to the central monastery where the fifth patriarch is already about to die. <clears throat> he cannot actually participate in any, in any real teaching, but he cannot read or write. Um, a lot of the teaching is done actually through the scriptures and studying like Avatar and Diamond and Heart Sutras and so on. There is a very, very important monk there. His name is Shen Xiu. He's the leader of all other monks. He's like the best student. And then comes the critical moment. All right? So who, So the fifth part here, his name is Hongren, as a bark is about to die. <clears throat> and as all, as all you know, great masters, he picks the day of his death. So just before the day of his death, he summons everybody and tells them <coughs> this. <clears throat> I preach to you that life and death is great concern for the people of this world. It's underlined because it will, it's an important language to remember. Um, but all of you spend all your time just seeking the fields of blessings, right? instead of trying to escape samsara. This is also a very important teaching. One of the encounters uh, that Bodhidharma is supposed to have had is with the Emperor Wu of the Liang Dynasty. Emperor Wu was a great sponsor of Buddhist practice. He sponsored the translation and publication of hundreds and thousands of sutras, built many, many monasteries. He, he gave himself 
bodily as a hostage three times to the monastic community um, and asked that the state pay the entire, um, talk about sequestering, he had to pay the entire budget of the state to the sun in order to rescue back the emperor. So when Bonnie Dharma supposedly met him, and uh, the emperor said, well, how much merit did I get for this? He said, you have no merit for it whatsoever. He said, how come I did all this stuff? He says, because your merit is only for blessings in this world. It's not about escaping from the world. What you've done is actually meaningless for the, for the Dharma. Um, the emperor was not so happy about that. And okay, so that's what he's saying here, that all these monks are doing all these practices in the monastery, but not really trying to escape birth and death. Right, just deluded to all the own self nature, you cannot be blessed, you cannot be saved by this. So you should go back to rooms and meditate on your self nature. What is that? Um, that's the wisdom of Prajnaya, and then write a verse. The best poem that I will judge would be the sixth part that will inherit my position here. So everybody goes to the room, but they all know that the best poem would be by Chen Xiao. I mean, he's, he's the best. So the next morning, um, the first poem shows up, and that's in fact by Shen Xiu's, by Shen Xiu, and that's what he writes. The body is the body tree, the mind is like a clear mirror. At all times you must strive to polish it, and must not less, must not less the dust collect. Right, so let's just talk about this for a minute. What do you think this means? What is the body is the body tree? You guess what that is? Right, so Shakyamuni Buddha got enlightened mm -hmm. under the Bodhi tree. So Shakyamuni Buddha <coughs> was wandering, uh, he left his, his palace, wandered in the, in the wilderness for about six years, and suddenly sits under a tree and gets enlightened and becomes known as the Buddha. So that, that tree under which he's sitting is called the Bodhi tree. So what he's saying here is that you don't have to go all the way to Nepal or India to get enlightened for that body. Your own body is, in fact, the Bodhi tree. Right? Your mind is like a mirror. But we have to polish the mirror. It's not clouded and it doesn't go away. And that's how we become enlightened by polishing it, right? Polishing the mirror. Is that meditation? That's what I think meditation That's what he's talking about. That's what he did in the monastery. They sit all day long. He yeah. does that. Paul told me that's two hours a day. These guys are doing more than that. Um, <laughs> so that's what they do to clean their, their, their mirror, right? Yeah, but I think this is fantastic. <clears throat> Quena cannot actually read this poem. So he calls somebody, say, well, what does this actually say? It's only, it's like graffiti on the wall of the, of the, of the monastery. Someone reads the poem to him and says, oh, I have a better one. He immediately blurts out his response. All right, so that's his response line by line. The body tree is originally not a tree. All right, the mirror has no stand. Buddha nature is always clean and pure. Where is the room for dust? Right, so there's a debate here within the Chan tradition of what is what they're actually doing. Right? So this one is called the graduate position. This one is called the sudden enlightenment position. So the graduate position says that you know it's a long, arduous task. This is a traditional position in, in Buddhism. It's, you don't just get enlightened, it takes you know, a lifetime. Sometimes more than one lifetime of effort to progress along this. And you see it, you practice, you practice, you practice, you get better and better and better. The Sun Enlightenment claim says, well, that's not, that's not the case. You can only be half enlightened. You're either enlightened or you're not enlightened. <laughs> and when you're enlightened, it's sudden, and it's complete, and it's total. But what they're making here is a, a more complicated claim. But what they're actually saying here is that all of these things that Chen Shou listed are, in fact, not real. They're empty. And when I say they're not real, I don't think that they can actually walk so this is really unreal. Uh, <clears throat> the position that Chen Shou is taking is the Mahayana position that's sometimes described as Buddha nature. Right? The reason that the Mahayana calls it the Mahayana, unlike the earlier schools, is that everybody can get enlightened in this lifetime. Uh, that's, a, that's why you need a big vehicle, like a, a bus or an aircraft carrier. The other traditions claim that one person at a time, they get enlightened on their own, they'll take a bike and they'll go to Nirvana. Might as well, everybody at once will do this all together, or many people. And that's because we all have Buddha nature within us. 
question is, what is the Buddha nature? What is the Buddha nature? The Buddha nature is the mind. It's in the mind. But it's not the mind as we know it. It's not the conscious mind with its anger and happiness and desires. It's the mind that's clarified and tranquil. That's why we need to strive to polish it, right? The mind has to be somewhat ground down and really about this tranquility. And the position that Huelang is taking is a position on the side of emptiness. The Buddha nature is, in fact, simply emptiness. You just have to realize it. And once you realize it, it's immediately enlightened. Right? Why would you think about this using a completely different metaphor from here, but this metaphor is very often used in these kind of discussions, is of the sun and the clouds. Right? The sun is always shining. The sun is hidden by clouds. But once the clouds move, the sun just shines forth. Right? You don't know, it's not gradually coming into, into shining. It just shines. Sometimes it's clouded. So your mind is clouded, but if, you, if the clouds are moved at once, it shines forth. Right, that's one way, another way to think about this. So this debate here is between whether you approach the Buddha nature or whether it's just originally already empty. But once you realize the emptiness, you'll just be enlightened completely and suddenly. And that's what Huelang apparently had attained anyway. Without studying, right, Chen Xiao, from the scholarly position, so my position, you know, studying, 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 clearly doesn't get it. But the practitioner, <laughs> your position, you know, you just have it, all right? So clearly you're on the better side than I am this. <laughs> so that's his so that's his argument. And what's particularly interesting in this particular text is that this version of the text I'm giving you is not the traditional transmission of this text. It's the platform sort of is so important that there's several different versions. So the one I'm using here is from a text which that was found in Dunhuang in that in other oasis up in, in western China that gives a slightly different version, at least an earlier version than the one that you find in transmitted texts. The same text actually contains this version also. So the Dunhuang version, the editor of that version, you know, had two poems that said, you know, they're both so good, I'll put them both in. And the later version, the one which I can transmit it, is this one. Um, but you can see how they're sort of playing with, with, with Huelang's poem to make it more and more to move towards this body, which is no tree, there is no stand, there's not a single thing that cannot be placed for dust to even collect. That's ultimate emptiness. We are confused about this. Right? We think there's all this dust because the dust is what's confusing us. But in fact, there's nothing there. Once you understand that, we will just be gone. There's no place. You can't even clean that dust. It simply will just disappear through this final realization, which is, in fact, ultimate. All right? So there's this debate here about um, Buddha nature and emptiness. But what do they do agree about? Both, all of them, all these versions, they agree on what? On the mirror. What's this mirror? They don't, they, don't dis they don't dispute the presence of the mirror. What they dispute is if it has a stand, it doesn't have a stand. What do you think is the mirror? So, one thing that they all agree on is that there is no self. That's also they agree on. Right? The, 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 this is from the earliest, earliest teaching of the Buddha, is to prove the absence of the self. And the absence of the self, and that's what we'll, we'll come back to here in a minute, the absence of the self is proven by um, taking apart the human person. Right, so the human person consists of the physical aspect, the form, all right, the skin, the bones, the blood, all that stuff. And I could ask you, is that where your self resides, what you would call a self? in the physical form. Like if I cut off your, your leg or something. So that's not, so the, so the physical form is not that, right? And above that there are four levels of cognition. It starts off with um, basic feelings of the you know, hot, cold. And above that there's um, higher, slightly higher level something called, something like something called discriminations. So if you have hot, cold, you say, I like it or dislike it. I want to be in the cold, I don't want to be in the cold. And above that, there's something like volitional formations, which is where karma fits in, where you say, well, I want to be in the cold, so in fact, I will go out and put a sort of entire motivation builds up around these sort of structures. And above all of that, there's consciousness. And importantly, at each level, you notice that there's no, you don't need a self, it could first of all, it self cannot actually be in that place. I mean, there's just sensations or feelings or volitional aspects. But also, you don't need a self to actually run the operation. 
everything is transitory, it's impermanent, it's not long-lasting. And what they're looking for is something that would be permanent and unchanging, because that would be a self. Everything else, I mean, it's just, you know, it's cold. It's cold. I mean, you know, we go to the next room, it's going to be hot. That cannot be yourself. You like, you know, well, I, just, I just finished this delicious brownie, so, you know, I was hungry and I'm no, no longer hungry, right? The question is, where does the self reside? So the work, the way up to consciousness, and that's sometimes for us, I think, is hard. <coughs> consciousness, they show, is composed of all these transitory feelings and sensations and thoughts. It cannot be a self. Memories come and go, they're not, you cannot trust them, that cannot be a self. There's no place for the self. On the other hand, that's where the person sort of operates. So the mind, the consciousness, is the main culprit of creating this illusion of the self. So the first, the most basic Buddhist practice is to get rid of that particular illusion. So when we talk about the mirror, we're not talking as much about the self, as much as the mind. The mind. Right? And the question is, why are we using the word mirror? Can you have a point of reference? Mirror turns things into opposites. Uh-huh. Um, it's also about perception mm -hmm. and object. Um, right, because the mind, because the mirror reflects. Yeah. Right? But where, where is this mirror? It's inside, it's not outside. It's, you're not looking at that mirror. Mm -hmm. All right? Yeah. Right. <coughs> yeah, so the, so, yeah, so the mirror is, is, is uh, that it's reflecting, it causes, <coughs> it, it does reflect outside. But the question is, who's looking at this mirror? And then, it's not you looking at the mirror, right? It's somehow you're looking from the mirror, mm -hmm. right? So why using this particular metaphor? It, it sort of makes sense to us, but we'll think about this. In more Just that the, you know, the mirror, what's in the mirror doesn't actually exist, right? I mean, it's yeah. the mirror, it, you know, you can't. Right, so what's in the mirror right? does not exist. Yeah, so that's actually a very, very good thing to think about. That what, what you see in the mirror is not actually there. It's somewhere else, right? What's in the mirror, it's a perfect mirror. It just reflects, the mirror itself is empty. There's nothing in the mirror. The mirror just reflects what the outside is. Right? So it's not so much about looking at the mirror as much as being the mirror, mm -hmm. right? So this particular metaphor, in fact, does not come from India. This particular metaphor actually is a Chinese, very complicated metaphor. So I'm going to talk about a few things here. I hope we actually get to talk about them. Actually, not this one so much. Um, we'll talk a little bit about ancient mirrors in China. But more important are two uh, philosophical, I put this in a picture because I actually think they're not really philosophical, but I don't have a better word for them right now. So one is this, is an ancient text called the Zhuangzi, another one is an ancient text called the Laozi. These are ancient Daoist, classical Daoist texts. So, First of all, um, what do we mean by mirrors? <clears throat> so Chinese mirrors are bronze mirrors. Right? That's the back of the mirror. The front of the mirror are all polished. The backs of the mirror are decorated with very, very important <coughs> symbolic um, aspects. And that, so these L's and V's, um, they're called TLV mirrors. They're, cos they're, 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 they're des describe the cosmology of the universe. All right, they have all kinds of inscriptions where thousands of these mirrors, almost all of them are found in tombs. Right, so they serve very important ritual purposes. The dead took them with them as guideposts to that world, or it's something very useful. This particular one is inscribed, and I just picked one because I didn't have time to talk about too many of those. This one that I picked, because it's about immortality, all right? Shangfang is just an official office where they used to make or uh, like a brand name. Mm -hmm. Like Yves Saint Laurent or Han Tanks. So the Shangfang office made this mirror um, <clears throat> on the subject of transcendence who do not know old age. But this is actually in the tomb, right? So it's, hope, it's maybe it's a hope for the tomb dweller that he will also not know old age. They drink from the Jade Springs, um, they eat um, jujube dates. The Jade Springs is interesting. The Jade Springs are actually um, your saliva glands, so meditation. You drink, you produce them, you produce um, so saliva and drink it, that's the jade spring. They drift beneath the heavens and ramble, you know, before the four seas, what pleasure. We have many, 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 many of these things, you know, and all kinds of wishes for immortality, you know, all of these mirrors. So mirrors were very, very important. Uh, 
I think we'll talk more about what they might be important for in other contexts, but to remove that to, in fact, look at what the character mirror actually means. It's actually important for what we should discuss it here. So this is the modern character mirror. Um, this, is, this is gold or metal, and this is um, looking. But this part here, okay, this part um, is this part here. But this part here, this is the oldest form of character, and this one is a person looking at a, at a pan of water. Mm -hmm. right? But it's reflecting. So they're trying to, so if the character screen now looks like this with, with, with the metal radical like here, but you can see the oldest form, this one and this one, is a person actually sitting and looking at a pan of water. So it's the water that's reflecting. With which radical? The metal radical? The, the metal yeah. the metal because this yeah. one the old right. forms don't have that yet yeah. or it becomes or maybe the pan is is, mm -hmm. is that but you can see that what it actually describes mm -hmm. it is a person looking at the vessel with water in it and it's the water that's reflecting that's actually a very very important part of what we're thinking about you want to think of a glass of water perfectly still mm -hmm. that's the mirror mm -hmm. it's not yet the mind okay. just what you think about the water what, mm -hmm. what this mirror actually is. Uh, it's not the, not, they're not writing that the bronze, they're writing a bronze mirror is in fact this, right? the perfect pan of water that reflects perfectly. All right? <coughs> Keep that in mind. We have a mind. So. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> so now a few words about the Tao Te Ching. So I brought some things for you to actually do some homework. Um, yeah. So, we're looking at some passages. I can't see it, what I actually brought up here. Ah, there it is. Yeah, so we're going to look at chapter 10 of the Tao Te Ching, but in two versions, because there's always there's problems with this. Um, okay, that's what we're going to do. So, chapter 10, you might help. Yeah. So, chapter 10. Yes, exactly. should be enough, yeah. And then we're going to look at. Um, Yeah. So you should have, have two, two pieces of paper. Yeah. I have I have one. Do you want? No, I think we got it. Well, there's two different types of Yeah, yeah. So it's a something. Yeah. So we keep that. He's got this. Yeah, the second yeah. You might need to fill the second one if it were shorter. So which one do you need? Second. Do you have a chapter 10? No. Oh, yeah. yeah. Do you have a 10? No. Do you have any more hands? Yeah. Okay. So I'll get chapter 10. So you can easily tell chapter 10 because chapter 10 is the second one. one. Which is the second one? So this one. Yeah. Yeah. So this one is the second one. All right. Great. All right, so we're going to talk for a few minutes about um, one of my favorite books, The Tao Te Ching, and I'll talk about another favorite book, um, The Chuanzi. So, uh, purportedly, the author is Lao Tzu, which means uh, Master Lao, or the old master. Um, just one comment. Uh, the next one is called Chuanzi. It says it means master, not, they're not all called Tzu, so it just means master. So Confucius is actually called Kong Tzu, it's a Kong. Um, most people in the West know this book by the title of Tao Te Ching, but they can pronounce it as Tao Te Ching. Even this is called as Tao Te Ching, so this, is, this transcription. Um, and it translates Jing, it's not like scripture, or in fact, when the Buddhist sutras arrive um, in China, they're all called Jing, so it's like classics or scriptures. Tao is the way, and De means something like virtue, or maybe the power that the Tao expresses, the Tao is an ineffable force. All right? Um, so just a couple of, if you've not read this text, this is how it begins. This is the first verse. The Tao that can be spoken of is not a constant Tao. The name that can be named is not a constant name. Uh, the name is the beginning of heaven and earth. The name is the mother of these other things. Without desire, you can see its mystery, but with desire, you can see its manifestations. These two spring from the same source. The different only name is called darkness. Sun, sun is called mystery. Darkness in darkness or mystery with a mystery, something which is called double mystery, gate of all mysteries. So we know about here that word Tao <coughs> literally means the way, like the, you know, the path or a highway or something like that. Um, but in this context, it really means 
like the process of things. The text actually tells us this is not the name, the real name of what we're discussing. We just have to use something in actual order to discuss whatever it is that we cannot actually name. Um, it's actually nameless. So we use the word doubt. We use this word to describe it or talk about it. Right? That's what it's, if you can talk about it, it's not a constant doubt. If you can name it, it's not what we're actually discussing. Uh, there are many, many doubts. <coughs> Um, judo, you go to tiptoe building, you can study more, many, many of these shadows, judo and so on. Um, <laughs> Zendo. Zendo is, yeah, all, all those are Taoists, yeah. yeah. So if you can talk about um, that, then that will be the discussing here. Um, what we're discussing here is, first of all, I want you to notice that it's the mother, and it's the name, that was the beginning of all things, something emerges out of Tao. We somehow try to understand what it is, and they're telling us here there's a hint, right? two ways that you can observe or see it. With desire, and this is the only place in this whole text where the, with desire has any positive value. It's all without desire. Without desire, which seems to mean cutting off sen uh, any kind of sensory interaction. You can see the mystery of the Tao. The right? Tao its unity, its formlessness. But with desire, you can see its manifestations. And manifestations is everything in the world. You can only see that with desire, with actual sensory inputs. The rest of the text is all about cutting off desire, because it really wants you to really go back to the primary mode. So there's two modes, maybe, to somehow work in this world. One is, you know, truly understand what, how the world operates, but then somehow cut off desire and actually see the mystery of the Tao, so the unity that's formless behind all things. They're actually the same thing. The things of the world and the Tao are actually the same. But it's just how they're the same, that's what darkness means. Or sometimes translated as mystery. The character change just means dark. It's in fact so mysterious, it's a dark within darkness. So that's what tells a little bit about what the Tao is like. Even more about the Tao. <clears throat> so this is in uh, chapter 42 of the text. The Tao gives birth to one, the one gives birth to two. Two gives birth to three. <laughs> um, the three gives birth to the mirror to all things. And all things carry yin and yang, and they, and they blend qi to attain harmony. <clears throat> so, what are we actually talking about here? There's two reasons I put, I put these terms here because I really want to discuss qi. That's the main point of this whole thing. But what does Tao gives birth to one, and then to two, and to three? What can it possibly mean by this? And there's more than one possibility here. Your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> well, I've done this many times, so I've made a lot of good guesses. One. Yeah, in uh, Zen we say one becomes three, three becomes one. That, yeah, because I'm using this design. Yeah, that, that's, that line is, is permeates all Chinese cosmology. I'm thinking of the character Y because. Oh, the English, the English letter one? Yeah. Ah, okay. Because it's a coin becomes two and from ah, okay. it's three. Yeah. And then from then it's like a fractal. That's, that's actually interesting. The fractal part of it is interesting. Okay. Yeah, the fractal part of it. The why, I don't know if that's the best when you think about this, but yeah. it's the fractal part of it is interesting. Um, but what's in, most important here is that Tao was even before one. What's, what's before one? Yeah, yeah it's, it's, there's nothing before one. But what we think about Tao is that it's not nothing, but it's a no thing. Right? It's not a thing that you even have. It's just it's before even one. Right? Another way I've recently come to think about this, what this can possibly so what some meanings as some of you might know, yin and yang are, are two basic principles by which the world operates. I should have brought a nice diagram, but I forgot to bring a nice diagram on that. Um, so the one is before the two. So maybe one makes the yin and the yang, but what is, what is the Tao? What, what is it talking about here? And we said that come to think, I wish I had a marker. <laughs> <laughs> I draw on our wall. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's good. I'll use that. This. I actually only did uh, this, this single line. So, I'll teach you some Chinese. Do you want a longer one? Do you, do you know Chinese? Well, you asked about the other words. Well, you know this one. What's this one? One line. One. One. Yeah. That's one. Yeah. Right? So one way that I think it's useful to think about what's going on here is that Tao 
is unitary. It's just alone in the world. Right? At some point, it realizes it's oneness. It becomes just one. And one is, in fact, a name. Right? But when it becomes one, there's an above and a below. Uh -huh. All right? That's already two things. And in fact, there's an above and below, and there's that relationship. That's already three things. And one sort of initial distinction occurs within the Tao itself, the world disappears. And as far as the Tao's are concerned, all they, all, they, all they are really concerned is how the Tao, original Tao, split. Otherwise, the actual process of how animals came to be created is not that important, because it all emerges from Tao. It's that initial break, because they want to go back to that unity. It's all about going back to the unity, understanding the unity. And the Tao is your own mind. In fact, the text we'll discuss later, Zhuang that talks about this as your own mind. That the mind understands itself and becomes two things. When you give a name to itself, the name and the subject are two things. And then the relationship is three things, and then the whole world sort of comes to be. So you always want to go back to that. And the way the world actually operates, that all things have yin and yang, and you blend your chi to this harmony. So, so can you explain the transition from two to three? All right, so if we have this oneness, well, that's one explanation. There's still other explanations, but this is a good one. Um, that you have this one as the peer, mm -hmm. right? And the, Chinese, the Chinese one just is this horizon. So you just imagine, if you go back to I don't know, astrophysics, you suddenly have a little horizon appear, mm -hmm. and you have above the horizon, below the horizon. That these are two things. That's the two. Right? But you have the horizon itself that yeah. separates it. That's the three. That's three things. Okay. You cannot have two things. Two things have a relationship. Right, so the way the Zhuang's other texts are don't talk about this is my own original interpretation. Otherwise, they talk about one becomes yin and yang, and then yin and yang have a relationship of qi. That's three things. Um, another way people talk about this, this is where the Zhuang talks about this, is as the mind of the inter things gives itself a name. Mm -hmm. So there's two things now. There's the thing and its name. But then what, what exactly is the relationship between the thing and its name? That's three things. And once you have that, primary separation, all things appear. So it's both sort of intellectual fragmentation, but also a cosmic fragmentation. There's so, you know, it's not really a creation story as much as a mind story. Mm -hmm. But that's how the universe operates, through yin and yang and qi. So just to explain what qi might be. Um, <clears throat> so qi is this uh, substance that pervades the universe. So you know, everything is made of qi. That's the character. That's one of the earliest texts we have. It's a jade piece, it's about two and a half inches, or two and a half inches tall, maybe three inches tall. But it's not two. Um, and the way the graph here, so the modern graph, which is this one, it's composed of two parts. It's clouds over rice. And this one, on, on the bronze here, it's, it's cloud over fire. And what you think about chi, which you don't really have a um, an English word, but even a concept to think about, is this kind of like a steam that fills the entire universe. And everything is made of this in different levels of compression. So Chinese medicine works on qi from the body. In modern Chinese, qi that you breathe is qi. And in fact, they'll talk about qi in the minute what I just asked you to read. So it's not just the air. It's sort of the ultimate substance. So that's the qi that you're embracing. Right, so with all this in mind, I want to look at, finally look at chapter 10 of Tao Te Ching. And I give, in fact, two translations. Um, <clears throat> so chapter 10 and chapter 54 are, in fact, the same text. The two translations of the same, of the same text. All right. <clears throat> and I think this is, this is one of those passages in Tao Te Ching that I think hints at the kind of practice that the text is talking about, all right? But it also hints, I think, at where some of the Dao, some of this later Chang practice picks up some of what they're actually doing. So supporting the earthly soul, don't get chapter at the 10, um, so the human body has more than one single soul. There's at least two. There's an earthly one and a, and a, and a sort of celestial one. You want to hold on to both of them. When they split is when you die. So you have to keep the packet together. That's the unity. So hugging the one is both hugging the Tao, but also your own unity. You would have to be together. If you leak out the spiritual aspects, your chi, you will die. Can you ensure they're not lost? 
right. Cotton and any tree to its weakest. Can you be a baby boy? Cotton and any tree to its weakest. The Chinese word for weak is ruo. In Chinese, it's ju. This is judo. It's the Tao of being soft. That's what, it, that's what this system is, is based on in this sentence. So you concentrate, right? It's opposite of what we do in the gym. But we want to become strong, but they want to become weak, or to be like a baby. So if you look at Tai Chi practice, um, it's like this is a rhythm of Tai Chi practice. It's from um, the chart from this, from the tomb is from this day. It's from the second century or so. There are several examples. So we're doing this kind of practice called guiding and pulling. It's chi practice, so to pull, and that's kind of one of the antecedents of today's martial arts. Mm -hmm. So um, again, so <coughs> you can be like a baby boy. Right? Washing and cleaning the dark mirror. By the way, the mirror. Right? Can you make it without stain? So polishing the mirror. So they're already talking about this. So that's what he's referring to. So the mind, but this is the dark mirror. The mind that's dark, like the Tao. So your mind reflects the Tao. That's what they're polishing. Your mind, if it reflects the Tao, it will be a dark mirror. Mm -hmm. Then it will be without stain. That's one source for that Chan, Chan uh, poems. Then it turns, in fact, to instructions for the, for the ruler. Loving people, giving up as a state, can you do it without knowledge? This is all for the ruler of the state. He's supposed to be this kind of great Tao's master. Opening and closing heaven's gate, can you do it like a woman? Discerning the four directions can do it without knowledge. So again, very opposite of what we expect to have. So your mind becomes dark, you will not leave, you will be the male ruler, but you act like a baby, like a female. She generates them. In other translations, there's no she, it's all it. That's thou. Thou is a female, and it's the mother. So he, in this translation, emphasizes a female. She generates them, she nourishes them, she generates all things. Uh, she quickens, uh, gives birth, but she not possess. The mother gives birth to things, she does not possess them. She's the opposite of the father. She doesn't want to give birth to anything, but possesses everything. Mm -hmm. So it's a very sort of female or yin-centered sort of practice that we're looking at. But this is one of the earliest places we find the mirror. Right? The dark mirror is what you need to polish in order to observe properly um, mm -hmm. the world. Can I, can I ask how old this is? The Dao Te Ching? Yeah. Uh, so this text, the Dao Te Ching, is probably from about the 3rd century BC. Right? So about 900 years before mm -hmm. uh, Bodhidharma, about 1,000 years before the Tatum Sutra. So this is very early in China, warring states period. It's upper Confucius, um, kind of unrelated to what's going on in India. So the of Buddhism in India at this time completely irrelevant to what's going on in China. It's two completely separate um, realms of development. All right, so that's one way to think about the source of this practice, right, with the actual mirrors, with this line. Now I'll talk about this particular person here, Zhuangzi. So he's on the back of, of this, one of these translations that I gave you. Um, so Mr. Zhuangzi, um, <clears throat> Master Zhuang, later, so later than, than Dao De Jing. Lao Tzu Paul is not a real person. John Tzu is a real person. Uh, we don't know too much about him. We had this sub-approximate dates because we know interacting with certain people, but so around the fourth century or so. So he somehow responds to Lao Tzu, but not quite clear. He's in fact, a, in some ways, much more interesting than John because it's such a, a crazy sort of text. So for example, um, I'll tell you just a little bit about his butterfly dream, his illustration. So the butterfly dream, his book is composed, I don't know if you see it, it's extra blue, it's this one here. Um, very short sort of snippets, chapter after chapter, but each one is like a single paragraph, a single page, a little story, an anecdote, and so on. So the butterfly dream is about himself. His name is Zhuang Zhou. It says Zhuang Zhou um, slept and he dreamt he was a butterfly, flying, you know, and fleeting and flying very happily. And then he woke up. And when he woke up, he could not distinguish whether he was Zhuangzhi who dreamt of a butterfly or a butterfly who's dreaming of Zhuangzhi. <laughs> and then there's another line that says, so the summary says, there must be a difference between Zhuangzhi and a butterfly. So that's kind of, this is a nice illustration because you don't really know who's actually dreaming in this case. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so we're going to look at one passage by Zhuangzi, um, and I think this passage might actually be similar to a story that Paul told me. So it's at the beginning of chapter 5 of this book, um, so I'm going to complete. <clears throat> and it's a person called Chang Chi who's talking to Confucius. Confucius is used here just as a sort of a straight man for a lot of jokes. Right. So he's not, it's not, this is not Confucius you will find in the actual text that Confucius actually talks. This is a Confucius like, like the joke Confucius that Zhuangzi uses. Um, so if we, we can look at this, and we can see um, that, Chang, that uh, Wang Tai is this great local sort of um, hero. Do you want this? Um, <clears throat> but his head is foot cut off. And in ancient China, Oh, yeah, I agree. In ancient China, all, all the crippled, all people who were, you know, had some sort of physical corruption were, were, were so symptomatic of some sort of moral corruption. People would be punished by having the legs chopped off or, or, or tattooed on their faces and so on. So it's very surprising that this guy has so many followers, right? So, John just Confucius, you know, Wang Tai has lost his foot. How can he, how can he be such a great person? How come people are actually following him? And Confucius, he's a sage, right? Um, he actually said, well, he's lost his foot, and he's still superior to the master, then how far about the common of man he can be, so he has to explain to him what a sage actually is. So this is kind of sort of interesting, right? Confucius begins by saying, life and death are great affairs. Right. That's the line that underlines for you in the charge by Mr. Hongren. He picks it from here. All right. He sees clearly into what is no falsehood. He takes it, you know, that fate is so on. So he holds us fast to the, to the source. So the sage holds fast to the source. Things cannot, don't change him. What do you mean by that? All right. If you look at them from the point of view of their differences, there's liver and, and gall, and then there's chew and yu. These are two states in ancient China. Um, they seem to be very, very different, right? They look at them from the sameness that you know, all things are in fact one. Right? So from the perspective of the Tao, everything is the same. You know, for us here in this little world, everything is so very different. But from the perspective of the Tao, it's all the same. You still understand that process. Um, he lets his mind play the harmony of virtue. So his mind is free. His mind is just free flowing. He just responds to things, right? And for things, he sees them as one does not see their loss. All things are the same to him. So he's rolled back, if you sort of think about that story about the one, two, three, ten thousand things, he's rolled back into two. All things are actually one. Mm -hmm. So for him, he regards the loss of the foot as a lump of earth thrown away. It doesn't matter. Leg here, leg there, it doesn't matter. Right? In, go, in the way he goes about him, he uses his knowledge and so on to get his mind. He uses his mind to get the constant mind. Right? So the constant mind, the Tao. What sort of thing is that? He's asking. Krishna says, that's another important thing. Men do not mirror themselves in running water. They mirror themselves in still water. I learned that the image of the mirror is really is still water. Right? So you don't want to look at the rushing water, but it's still water. But you still your water. Only what is only what is still is in the stillness of other things. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the still water, your mind will still become still. So you still your mind by looking at the still water. So the reflection goes both ways now. But the, which is, in fact, the mirror. Yeah. Right, so the still water is the mirror, but if you look at that, your mind will become still. So your mind is, in fact, the mirror of the still water, which is sort of the model of your mirror. All right, so that's this line here. here. All right. So this, this model of, of, of the mind of the sage as a mirror is repeated two or three times in this text. Right? In chapter 7 and chapter 13, it talks about perfected person. I want you to remember this name also, Jera, right? The perfected person. Right? Don't be in a body of fame, don't be sort of scheme. Okay? Don't, don't try and be this great, ambitious person. And it's, it, a, a, a real per person, a really great politician and so on. What you really want to do, the perfect person uses their heart mind. When they talk about mind, they use the word heart, chi. Right? That's what you're thinking takes place, like mirrors going after nothing, welcoming nothing, responding but not storing, that's what you said before. Mm -hmm. So the mirror responds to things, mm -hmm. but it doesn't actually store them. Mm -hmm. right? It just reflects things. So your mind reflects the, the world as it is, but does not absorb it, does not get wrapped up in it. Just let's go. When things move on, your mind gets, just lets them go. 
You don't absorb, you don't keep anything. That's the perfect person. Therefore, they can win over things and not hurt themselves. Because your mind just seems free. Another way that it describes water still, it gives back a clear image of beard and eyebrows. Right? So, again, water, narrative the water gives a clear image, and your eyes will see that image clearly. All right? <clears throat> How much more so contrary to spirit? So, if you, your chi, all right, we talked about chi before. That's another word to talk about this is contrary to spirit. It's like liquids, it's kind of chi, is this substance. If it's contrary, it's even more reflective than still water. It's even more purified than clear water. For the sages, heart and mind is stillness. In mirror of heaven and earth, glass, that's another, it's not, it's not that, it's, it's glass as, as a mirror. Um, it's just another Chinese character. <coughs> of the 10,000 things. So the mirror is the mirror of heaven, also, also the mirror of the 10,000 things. Right? Ah. So it's perfect stillness of the mind that allows it to reflect things perfectly. Things come and go, and you just don't hold on to so the mind remains, in fact, empty. And the image that they actually have of it is a still pan of water, right? Uh -huh. Completely unmoving. Any shift, happiness or anger, joy or disgust, causes waves. So it's imperfect. That's why you have to still you when they talk about stilling the mind, making it still, it means stilling it like water. So it's perfectly it's perfect chi. It's kind of glass of chi or glass of water. That's the perfect mind, which will reflect perfectly. And it will reflect in fact the mind of the sage. In this case, it reflects the mind of the Tao. But when we skip forward again, the Hoyang, so after his death, his name is actually Great Master of Great Mirror. That's his official, that's his posthumous title. That's in fact his, his uh, mummy. It's funny, mummy in Guangdong. Um, and the preface to the, to the Platform Sutra says, the Platform Sutra is that by which a perfect man, Jiren, the same word we saw in the, in the Zhuangzi, him revealed his mind. So he revealed his mind through his text. It's his perfect mind. What mind? The wondrous mind transmitted by the Buddhas. It's the same mind. Buddha to Buddha to Quainan and to the readers of the Platform Sutra. But probably to every practitioner of Zen, they can still their minds. All right. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much for taking time to come share with us. Um, and, you know, who has questions? questions? <coughs> yeah. When you had the map and you saw how Taoism improved, what, um, what are the roots of uh, Taoism in, in China? Taoism or Buddhism? Taoism. Taoism doesn't have roots. Taoism is sort of local. Uh, yeah. Uh, you mean this map? What, uh, this map here. Yeah, I, no, this, this is Buddhism. This is Buddhism. Yeah. Buddhism arrives in China. Taoism is already sort of here. Taoism, um, Taoism is sort of, sort of here. <laughs> it doesn't move um, very much. It spreads in China. Um, it starts in different kind of places. It really depends how you localize it. Mm -hmm. uh, both, well, Zhuangzi we know, this is, this is the center of classical China. We talk about Confucius, he's active in this area here. He's actually active more here, but these are the old capitals. Um, Lao and Zhuangzi are probably more active in the southern area. This is the Yangtze River. So they're probably active more in the south. Um, as as um, the Chinese so develop, um, or maybe more precise, the Taoism I study. Right. Not, well, not this philosophical stuff, but layer stuff, which actually not talked about. Well, the ritual systems that are present now starts off around um, around the same time that Buddhism was introduced around the first centuries when also Dan sort of as an actual religious community. Again, starts, some of it starts here in um, the Sichuan province, and some starts here um, on the coast. So different traditions and stroke merge, and there's all kinds of new traditions. And this continues to the present. So Dan is very hard to define, but it's always very localized. I have friends who are now working in Hunan province, which is so behind this sign here. Um, it's a local tradition in, 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 uh, in Hunan province, so actually just in one county. Different villages with different traditions. We didn't know, we didn't know they existed until about 10 years ago. Some of survived through the Cultural Revolution and everything. Yeah. Wow. Um, 
and they're local. And you can sort of see, I, I, I worked, most of my work was in Taiwan. And you can sort of see that they're somehow similar, but it's, it's, there's no other place where you can find, the, you only find local DAOs, you never really find another version of it. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's very hard to sort of pin it down in that, in that sense. Uh, these guys here in, in uh, Pune do a lot of uh, meditations also, but also at the, uh, Buddhist, some of the Buddhist initiations, as well as Taoist initiations, as well as the local tradition initiations. Um, the guys in Taiwan, all the twin initiations, local, and sort of a more general kind of name for Taoism. It's a bit complicated in that, in that, in that way. Um, Taoism never really made it, so it sort of spreads within this culture itself. Buddhism, um, and that's why it's so successful, so I an mean, example here. Buddhism is very successful at not being localized, say, to India. It can really transmit some very, very well. Um, Taoism is really about the caves and the mountains in China. So it's very hard to, to move to another, another place. Um, so, Chinese, so Buddhist mythologies are very, very easily transferable. You don't even need to even transfer the mythology of Buddhism to actually practice Zen, for example. But Taoism is really wrapped up in local mythology, which are very, very Chinese. And you sort of write them, they sort of write themselves into every place that they go to. So they spread very solidly, but they can't really skip over to other cultural areas. So when you talk about there being localized to the caves and mountains, are you talking literally? Like this? Yeah. Okay. Well, also mythically, but yeah, they, but, but but also but also literally. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, for example, I mean, the tradition that I work with a lot, the the whole tradition of of um, cave heavens, of underground yeah. tunnels that connect uh -huh. various mountains. And actually, probably reflects some real connection between these various regions, but very far away from each other. Yeah. Um, and that those underground caves sort of explain how they could have practices so far removed from each other together. Um, but they tie things together. Uh, yeah. Buddhists don't have that. Buddhists have. Buddhists. I mean, what's, what's interesting is, um, you know, so there's all these Buddhist locations in India, and then named by Raja Griya, Vulture Peak, and so on. But you have the same mountains in China and in Japan. So when Buddhists arrive here, say, so, okay, this is Rajagriya, or this is Rajagriya. <laughs> so Japan sort of maps itself into, or rather, Jap Japanese map India onto Japan, no problem. Um, but they, could, they did not do that with China. Yeah. Maybe because they knew China too well. Um, so it was much more easily transferable in that, in that way. Another reason is that Taoism is secret transmission. Mm -hmm. We were talking about Taoism about that before. Mm -hmm. You have to have a teacher. Before you can even start practicing. There are all these uh, schools for other yeah. home philosophy schools that <coughs> survived during the Cultural Revolution. Um, China. Yeah, you know, the, 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 you know, for us, the Cultural Revolution sounds like a horrific. It was a horrific thing, mm -hmm. but to quote one of the leaders of the Chinese Communist Party, <coughs> Deng Xiaoping. They asked me about the French Revolution. Was that successful? He said, well, it's a bit too early to tell. Um, so the Cultural Revolution is so small in the grand scheme of Chinese history. So yeah, they survived it. I mean, there a lot of damage done, but you know, not, it's not back to exactly the way it was. But they did huge amounts of destruction. But if you go back now to um, a lot of places, they're rebuilding all the temples. Some of them are built in really horrific, but they're you know, really badly built. I mean, they have bad taste, but there's more money now, so people are bringing back stuff. A lot of stuff, a lot of, a lot of overseas Chinese from Singapore, Hong Kong, and also from the United States are investing back in their home villages, and the first thing they do is build, rebuild their shrines and their temples that have been destroyed. Um, in some places, the damage is worse if, if the actual priests died or were killed because they 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 not have time to transmit their actual knowledge. Like, that really matters more to local tradition than to something like Buddhism, because Buddhism is an institution. So one monk dying does not actually destroy particular tradition. But local tradition, villages could be damaged by this. So you know, there's a big resurgence now in China of institutional religion like Buddhism, um, less so on local, more localist things like Taoism, which, is, which could be more personally so if someone disappeared, it just disappeared. Um, in some cases, um, the priests buried um, buried their stuff underground, but they were old priests, so they may not have been killed, but they just died. And by the time this 20 years later, when they said, "Okay, you can practice again," no one remembered where they buried their stuff. Um, and if they did find, no one knows how to really use this stuff. But again, you need to have a teacher tell you how to use the text and how to use this various object and so on. So the Buddhists are doing much better. The Buddhists also not so suppressed in the, in the Cultural Revolution because they have monasteries. 
so they're separate from the local populations, but they suffer a little bit less. And now they're, they're fine. Um, what is wrong with the word roots for roots? Roots for me? Um, I think it's too um, too rooted. <laughs> you know, Dallas roots of, just, you know, the, well, they are sort of roots in some way, but not, they're not the only roots of, of, um, of, of China, actually China's main sources, how they sources. So it's more and more of a water, water, water metaphor than the wood metaphor. I've heard it said that um, Dallasism was influenced by Hinduism. Um, Is there any truth to that? Not really. Um, there is a theory that, that some texts were perhaps very similar to Bhagavad Gita, and so perhaps they had seen the Bhagavad Gita, except that there's, when you actually look at the actual text, there's actually nothing similar to Bhagavad I mean, you know, some of the lot of the mystical texts sound sort of similar to the only translation, but in the actual texts, they're not really the same. Hinduism is, well, Hinduism, well, it would be Brahmanism or Vedic religions, not too much what we call Hinduism today. There was not too much contact that we can really find. There may have been earlier Buddhist contact that we realize. That might be, that might be possible. We have actual evidence for first century, but it's possible that was some, some stuff coming earlier, even. Mm -hmm. so, so under the radar that we don't really see. Um, <clears throat> the, one of the issues mm -hmm. is, of course, when Buddhism arrived in China, it begins, becomes, it begins to be translated. So the Chinese actually read in Chinese. They don't actually read in any other language. They read only Chinese. So the first translations are very, very Taoist, and then they, be, and then they work out more what these words actually mean, and they have changed translations and so on. So the earliest translations that you look far more, they seem to be more Taoist, but that's only because of the language they use. Um, that sort of changed over time as well. Um, Taoism itself is, is very influenced by, by Buddhism throughout. It kind of, in some ways, sort of a response to presence of, of, of Buddhism. Um, so the box in Ireland, but also, so kind of, so also like a feedback loop. So I mean, what actually happens in China, a lot of these traditions become very Taoist anyway. Because why people talk about Zen in particular, it's very Chinese. Because all these, as you saw now, even now, without it being a great exercise, you saw all these lines from the Platform Sutra are coming from the Zhuangzi. Mm -hmm. And we didn't even do a hard work for this. It's just uh, you know, a couple of underlines mm -hmm. and, and show it. Um, we go through many, many texts and find more and more of this stuff. A lot of these Taoist guys have embedded in these all kinds of Zen mythologies and stuff. It's seen interesting. You mentioned how important the teacher is yeah. to Taoism, and that you, so you say you even need a teacher before yeah. you can practice, yeah. and that seems to be true in the Zen tradition too. That exactly. There's this really yeah. strong yeah. emphasis on it. Yeah. Teacher. So one of the ways in which people should actually talk about the Chineseness of Zen is precisely through this very strict. Genealogy, who is your teacher, who is your teacher, who is your teacher, all the way back to Bodhidharma and the Bodhidharma. Mm -hmm. And you can't just say, oh, I just made it up. Right. The Chinese don't have that sort of stuff. Uh, so Buddha can just say, you know, I just found this new thing, and you know, there you go. Um, you, you don't have stuff like this in China. You always have to have, at least pretending to have a master. Right. You have to have someone <laughs> who has an attitude to teach you. Yeah. Right. Um, Buddha, I mean, Shakyamuni never said someone taught him. He just came up with this only totally on his own. Um, that's, that's not the case in China. So very clear genealogies. Um, and also talking about your disciples as your, as your children. Right. Yeah, what are the functions of the koans for the practice? Koans? Yeah. Um, so, you, see, you know, like, like this one here, um, this, is not, this is not yet a koan, but this is called an encounter dialogue. And an encounter dialogue, is when an um, enlightened person, an enlightened teacher, realizes that, his, that a particular person is just on the cusp of realization, if she says something really, something that would sort of move him over to the other side, right? Because it's sudden and complete. So you're just on the edge, you're not yet enlightened, but something will shift your mind. So in this case, he says, you bring me your mind, which obviously you cannot, so if you realize that, that you cannot, that your mind does not, is not an actual thing you can bring, that's the moment of enlightenment. Right, that's in current dialogue. And in later um, developments, this kind of dialogues were sort of cut out to like have only like single line sometimes or like very short, brief statements. Those are chords. So a chord is sort of a, like a riddle phrase or a, or, a, or a particular, not necessarily a question, but it's sort of a phrase that is supposed to sort of give you a sense of 
there's something there that I don't understand. And that leap across across that non understanding is what would project your mind into the, into the non mind. Um, so the one of the earliest one of the one of the collections of, of koans, um, it's called the blue the blue cliff koans. Um, the first one is does a dog have Buddha nature? I just talked about Buddha nature. Remember Buddha nature. So does a dog have Buddha nature? And the answer is, the answer is in in in, in, in Japanese it's mu, in Chinese it's wu. In verbal translated is no. But in fact, that the the kind doesn't mean no; it means non. It's like it's a negative, complete negative, not no specifically. So does a dog have Buddha nature? No. Really means that your question is the wrong question. You're not really. All right. So, but it takes time to figure that out because well, a dog that's happened to actually, you can debate that. In fact, it's clear that do put it in nature, but what would even ask about a dog? So the point is that no is like your question is, is no. You cannot ask that kind of question. You cannot ask, do you have Buddha? You Buddha nature the things you actually have. You are Buddha nature. Buddha nature is just there. You don't own Buddha nature or something like that. You know, so it's this kind of questions. Um, or um, the most famous one that Hakui made up, um, what's the sound of one hand clapping? <laughs> you know that one? <laughs> That's a tree fall in the forest and no one hears it, doesn't make a noise. And that, and that, that one has an answer. Uh, but, you know, it, it's, a, it's again, it's, it's about how all things are dependent on each other. So your presence, that's a very, kind of a very modern scientific kind of trauma that one. Because your presence creates the noise. Anyway, so the cons project into that kind of another mindset completely. Uh.